Hello guys, it's your boy Insomnia. I know it's been some time since I uploaded my last video. <laughs> But over the last few months, I teach myself some basic programming and game development. You see, the big studios nowadays keep releasing empty solace and broken games all the time, so I thought, hey, I can do that too. So I decided to recreate the classic game Flappy Bird, but in 3D, which is very ooh la la. I actually started this project using the Unity game engine, but I never got the collision working properly and I couldn't figure out how to fix that and then I got bored and so I picked Unreal Engine 5. A beautiful piece of software that brought us Borderlands and the Gollum game. Two equally great games which show the true potential of the engine. First I created a new empty project and added a camera actor to the scene. I also deactivated motion blur and anti-aliasing because I want those <coughs> crisp graphics. Since we are still in the process of making a rough prototype, our player will be a simple cube for now but soon it will be a majestic phoenix flying through the skies or something like that i don't know yet so i wrote some code that will make my player jump and play a sound effect when i hit left mouse or spacebar and since i don't have any custom sounds yet i will just use some random placeholder effect from the engine's content Perfect. now we can position our player on our level and it's working the next thing I want to do is rotate the player based on its up and down movement. So every frame we will get the current Z velocity of our player which is positive when it goes up and negative when it goes down. We add that velocity to our current Y rotation of the player and then we multiply that with a float to control how much our player should tilt. Then set that as the new Y rotation of the player. While this technically worked, it was rotating around the wrong axis for some reason. And no matter what I did or how I positioned the cube, it would always continue to rotate in the wrong direction. No, don't go that way. So for what felt like an eternity, I tried to figure out what was going on here. And eventually I realized that every single frame, the Y and Z rotation of the cube would be set back to zero, no matter how I positioned the player. So I set the rotation of my player from zero to 90 degrees inside my script, and that fixed the issue. Big brain. So right now our cube starts falling as soon as the game begins. Wow. But in Flappy Bird, the game starts in a pause state. So let's do that. In my script, I pause the game as soon as the player becomes active. But we only want to be able to unfreeze the game with the very first jump input, since we don't want to be able to unpause the game while we are in the game over screen. So I created an integer called click counter with a value of zero that gets increased on the first jump. Now we can make sure that the game only gets unpaused if the click counter is equal to zero, disabling the unpause function for any future inputs. And now when we start the game, we are in the pause state until we hit the jump button once. No. The next step is to create a horizontal barrier that our cube can collide with if we fly too high or too low. So I created another cube and attached a box collision to it. And using the collider's overlap event, we can execute some code if we hit the barrier. For now, let's just print out a string that says hit and see if it works. I position the first barrier right above our player and scale it up until it fills out our camera's entire horizontal field of view. Now we can just copy the top barrier and move it down by the same amount. So as you can see, this is working as intended and we get a hit print if we hit either the top or bottom barrier. I also want to apply a black and white color effect when we crash. So I added the post process volume to my barrier, set its global saturation value to zero, and set it to not visible by default. Then we toggle its visibility when the overlap gets triggered. And when we now hit the barrier, we see a very sad cube. As our second obstacle, we need a set of pipes, which will move from right to left, giving us the illusion that our player is floating to the right. So I created another cube, rescaled it, and added a box collision to it. Then I just copy-pasted what I just did and positioned it in a way that there is still a gap that our player can fly through. Seems legit. Now in order to actually move the pipes, we will multiply a constant with delta time and then set that as the Y location offset to move the pipes at a speed that is frame rate independent. Then I also copied the post process volume and code from the horizontal barrier, so we get the exact same behavior on both collision boxes. Now we could of course place all those pipes manually and play the game, but this would be a very tedious process. And at some point there won't be any pipes left to fly through. It would also always be the exact same pattern. So let's generate this stuff with some randomness. For starters, I just made a simple script that spawns a single pipe at the X and Y location of the spawn actor. Since we want to randomize the pattern of the pipes, we will set the Z location to a random float and range, which should spawn the pipes anywhere between our two horizontal barriers. In this case, anything between 300 and 
and minus 300. Then I added a delay and just looped that entire thing to control the spawn rate and distance between the pipes. Now our spawner will create a new set of pipes every 3 seconds. Only problem is that those pipes will still be rendered even when the player can't see them anymore. This would definitely impact performance on a long run. In order to fix that I gave each spawn pipe a lifespan of 15 seconds. That is enough time to travel through the entire screen space before they eventually get despawned outside the player's field of view. Now let's create some kind of score system that keeps track of the amount of pipes we passed successfully. For that I created a variable inside a new blueprint actor. And every 3 seconds, which is the spawn interval of our pipes, a sound will be played and our score variable will be increased by 1. Since it takes more than 3 seconds for the very first pipe to reach the player, I set up a longer delay before the loop begins. I actually thought about using another collision box behind the gap of the pipes to increase the score, but since the distance between pipes will always be the same anyways, a timing based system just made more sense to me. It's also easier and I'm a lazy piece of shit. To make this game a bit less static and repetitive, I also wanted to create a basic day and night cycle. So inside my level blueprint, I get a hold of our directional light and added rotation to it. Since it becomes really dark during nighttime, I also added a point light to my player cube so we can actually see something. Though I feel like flying around at night is not really fun and the night cycle is just as long as the day. So now I also wanted to make the night way shorter than the day. To do that, I created a float as a rotation speed multiplier for our directional light, which will be really high if the sun's rotation is currently at an angle that creates nighttime and pretty low when the light's rotation creates daylight. Now the night will go by really fast and the day will continue at a normal pace. The core mechanics are almost done now. The only problem is that aside from the screen turning gray, nothing happens when you actually do hit an obstacle. He did the same joke about three times already. I don't think it's funny anymore. In the widget designer tab, I just added three text boxes and bound one of them to our current score variable. The layout, of course, looks pretty shitty right now. And like everything else, I will make it pretty later on. So let's create a game over screen that will play a sound get a reference to our score so we can display it and also set the game back into a pause state. Now we can display our game over screen by initiating it right after our collision events get triggered. And if we hit an obstacle now, we see a game over screen which shows our score, the sound is played, our screen turns gray, the game stops and hitting jump will not unpause the game. I added the option to reload the level with R or go back to the main menu with Q. I also added this information to the game over screen by adding another text box. Of course, we don't have a main menu yet. When we actually do hit the Q button, Unreal gets hella confused since there's no reference for a specific level it should load. What the hell is even that? I created a new map called Main Menu, added a camera actor and set it to be active. Now we can reference our main menu level inside our quit function. So if we now hit Q while playing the game, we move to our main menu, which of course course looks pretty empty right now. We'll come back to this later. I also just realized that since we developed this game, we obviously know the controls for our player, but someone else has no clue. And can we even call this a real game if there's no tutorial in it? I don't think so. The microphone's hella sensitive. So I added another text that tells the player which key to press in order to jump. This hint will disappear when the player actually jump once. Now everyone knows what to do and what buttons to press even when playing the game for the very first time. Nice! The next thing I wanted to do is displaying the current score live while the game is running. For that I created yet another widget and just added some placeholder text for the FPS and score values. I created a script with the simple calculation of 1 divided by delta time which returns our current FPS value. Then I store that number in an integer to access it in our HUD widget. Though while running the script and printing out the FPS on every single frame, I realized it is almost impossible to actually read the number because we get way too many updates. So I removed the tick function Perfection. and used a simple loop with a delay of 0.3 seconds instead to reduce the update frequency. With that now working as intended, we can go back into our HUD widget and bind our FPS and score values to our placeholder text boxes. <laughs> I'm running out of <laughs> oxygen. <laughs> then we just initiate the game HUD at the beginning of our player script and now players can keep track of their score and see the current FPS. Because what's a game without some good old numerical feedback, am I right? The only problem is that it stays active even when the game over screen becomes visible. I fix that by removing all widgets from the viewport right before the game over screen gets called. Our prototype is almost done now and there's only one piece missing, the main menu. Of course we already made one before, but it is still completely empty without any buttons or text and no way out of it. 
So let's add some functionality to the main menu so the player doesn't get stuck in here forever. I created another widget and added a text for the game's title, one button to start the game and another one to quit it. The play button simply brings us into our main level and the quit button just closes the application. At this point, our game loop is finished. We have a main menu where we can start or quit the game. The game only starts once the player hits the jump key. Scores are being tracked and displayed live on screen. And when we collide with an obstacle, the game gets paused, showing us a game over screen with the option to play again or quit. But we don't want to stop here, right? We didn't do all of that just to release our game in this half as prototype state, right? No. <laughs> what the fuck was that? <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. Let us do what AAA studios struggle with nowadays. Actually polish and finish the game before we release it to the public. I'm Todd Howard. I'm going to give you guys a tour of our uh, new studio. So this is an old uh, compact Rosario that we use. So let's replace the basic pipes and our player cube with an actual 3D model. We also need to design our main menu, make our widget and UI elements pretty, and replace all placeholder sound effects using my exquisite top tier audio engineering skills. Then we can build this project and upload it to itch.io, where you guys can finally play and experience this masterpiece for yourself. To download the game, check the link in the description. I even reached out to some content creators, and I'm thrilled to say that a small YouTuber was willing to playtest the game and record his reaction. Let's check it out. Hello everybody, my name is Markiplier, and welcome back to the Try Not To Laugh Challenge. Interesting. <clears throat> it's not funny. It's not funny. Not funny. <laughs> That's fantastic. It is not as challenging and fun compared to the original Flappy Bird, but on the other hand, the performance is worse too. <laughs> but look at those sweet guard rays. You like that? You like that, huh? <laughs> Oh, by the way, if you're a developer, I want to share a sweet optimization trick that I learned. It will give you a massive FPS boost in any game you make. You just take the return value of your current FPS and multiply it by fucking, I don't know, 100. And just like that, your game is running at 12,000 FPS. Big profit. Huge optimization. If you have any game ideas, let me know in the comments and I might do it in a future video. Anyways, I'm very happy that I was able to make my very first game from scratch and had a lot of fun while doing so. Aside from some minor bugs, I also encountered one really weird not so minor buck along the way like what the hell is going on here the plane had a mind of its own it doesn't even need a jump input anymore for some reason it finds a way on its own and i don't know why this doesn't make any sense and it scares me this is yet another example of ai getting out of control this is why artificial intelligence will destroy us one day